All right, I guess we got to sleep. Nothing else really to do. Now yeah, we'll pass the night here, indeed. This, then, is the North Pole. Uh, it is a city with streets of carved ice filled with a mixture of Arctic peoples. Too many colors and creeds to count. Never before had I seen a place that disregarded the national the national so completely as though here in the north the distinctions of longitude truly did not in fact exist we disembarked in a hobbling procession led by monsieur jeho people watched us as we passed suspicion and fear in their faces i smiled and nodded assiduously hoping to reassure soon enough a few enterprising Nanette P children slipped their parents' grips and walked alongside us, ch chattering. It is not personal, Madame Jeho put a... Supposed to be Madame or... or Monsieur. Put a hand on my elbow. You are the first outsiders to set foot here since the city's founding. The first, I exclaimed. Just so, she nodded. I had to beg my father to let you come. I heard the bitterness of old hurts and congealed resentments in her voice. It seemed her relationship with her people, her family, was not so simple as to be easily encompassed under the word duty. What will happen to us? Madame Jehu. Wow, the spelling is all over the place. Madame Jeho's expression was unreadable. We will tend to the injured and let you rest. Tomorrow, most likely, you will be called to the council. For judgment, I asked, half-jokingly. At least that was what I told myself. She only set her mouth into a thin line and led us silently to a low-roofed tent hung with carved walrus tusk and polished antlers, no doubt hastily cleared out for our arrival. No matter, at least we are alive. Yeah, might as well explore. The only thing to do. I claimed a bed heaped with furs and blankets, and after being chased from Monsieur Fogg's bedside by a sharp-tongued doctor. Oh, I sought out Madame Jeho for more answers. I was not the only one to have this idea. She was in the midst of a heated argument with the chief navigator. I hung back for a moment to listen. Oh, we were colleagues, friends, the chief navigator stormed. You interfered with my instruments. I had a compelling reason, Dam Joho replied shortly. I found my shoulders hunched defensively. What reason, I demanded. What was your mission in amongst the artificers like that? It was not to murder you, her dark hair flew about her face. The world is not so simple. I will not let you cast me as a villain. And what are you? I am... I... Rage dissipated, leaving her face empty and ravaged. I am trying to live my life the best I can in the circumstances that I was born into. You see how strange those circumstances are? Hiding up here like thieves in an attic? We are more than our circumstances, I set my jaw. We can choose new paths, make them if necessary. Sometimes each choice is a sacrifice. And all you can decide is what to lose. Madame Jeho surrendered, or shuddered. <laughs> she surrendered. Uh, maybe we should just... Uh... Let's do it. I pulled her in into an impulsive embrace. She sobbed once, harsh and terrible, before scrubbing her hands over her face lean wordlessly into the night. Well, I don't know if that helped. But you know what, let's sleep some more. The council met against the towering steam boilers in the heart of the city, both literal and figurative. Fifteen men and women sat in simple chairs of sinew and fur, drawing their authority from the technological marvel which they commanded. The survivors of the expedition were gathered, and I saw familiar faces among them. The chief engineer and pilot, jostling. 
Monsieur Mazinski and his Pomer Pomer hunters glaring and gaping in equal measure. I stood apart part with Monsieur Fogg, who was rather irate that, do that the doctors had taken his clothes and garbed him in Sammy fashion. I was no artificer and I did not want to be taken as one. Monsieur Jeho stood and silence rippled out. He spoke a commanding sentence in... Was that Turkish? The artificers nodded, apparently conversant in the tongue despite their largely Nordic origins. I peered at them in bafflement. Madame Jeho elbowed me sharply. Pay attention, she hissed. I realize my... Mi my Mistake earlier, that's her father. Uh, can you interpret for me? I hissed back. Turkish, really? Madame Jeho translated the counselor's words. Uh, Kwasutek. Kwasutok was founded for one purpose, for the circumpolar peoples to learn and develop the technologies of steam and oil and automata to make them our own before they destroy our homes, our culture, our way of life. A grand plan, I murmured admiringly. Clever plan. We have seen what has happened to the Native Americans, to the First Peoples, the Kazakhs and Buryats. Buryats. Madame Jeho's face was still as carved stone, and it was, was clear she spoke her own words rather than the counselors. We will not let that happen to us. The council erupted in argument, stealing whatever response I thought to give. What are they arguing about, I demanded. The council wants to stay isolated and keep all of you prisoner, Madame Jeho cast me a look of pinched sympathy. The shamans are voting with them for a change, but the progressives recently discovered more oil and natural gas in the Barren Sea and are petitioning for the right to hire outside drilling expertise, so they're voting against isolation and the international unionists have been looking for an excuse to start throwing their weight around. International unionists, I ask faintly. Ah, oh yes, they want a nation of circumpolar peoples tying together any lands that fall within the Arctic Circle. Madame Juho smiled. We are more Arctic than we are Russian or Finnish or Laplander, are we not? What does a Muscovite truly know of winter? Do you support them? If they succeed, then we will be at war with half the world. I am too practical to court war, her eyes gleamed, or now anyway. There was a sudden hubbub and a loud announcement. I heard some of the expeditioners gasp in tremulous smiles on a few faces. What did the counselor say? I demanded. But Madame Jeho's expression was blank. As per two, I am sorry. What did they say? You will be our guests until the council is ready to announce itself to the world. I shook my head in despair. A set of guards began herding us back to our lodgings and I threw myself on my pallet. This, it seemed, was to be the end of our great adventure. Oh, is it really? Or are we gonna escape? Is she gonna help us? I mean, that's... Well, how else are we going to continue our journey and get back to London, right? I woke in the semi-dark to find my master shaking my shoulder. Monsieur Fogg, I exclaimed. He placed a finger to his lips, and at his unspoken command, I quietly followed him into the ice-packed streets. We are not staying here, Passepartout, told me, and then pointed at a pair of dark airships to the west of the city. We have a wager to win, and that is our way out. Shall we sneak aboard, Monsieur? I said softly. Uh, we will remain hidden till we are away from the Quasituk, and then, he paused delicately, adjust our plans to emergent circumstances. Ah, I said sagely. We'll improvise. Quite so, he replied readily enough. Which airship should we aim for? I scrutinized, or scrutinized, whatever. Them both. There was nothing to tell them apart. 
Ooh. Left hand path. I the one on the left, I said, and felt immeasurably better for having made a decision, however arbitrary. Well then, said Monsieur Fogg, let us depart. Well, that's uh where we're we going. Well, we'll be going, I guess, through to North America. That's quite Wait the route. Oh, we're going to Winnipeg. Oh, we can negotiate and we're gonna pay early or pay. Ooh. Um, that's like the only place for us to go. Departs tomorrow. Okay, well, I guess we'll sleep and wait till tomorrow. We stayed another night, resting and preparing our escape. You know, the only route we have available to us. Yes, let's disembark. Uh, well, we're gonna be... Uh, this is gonna be quite... uncomfortable. Monsieur Fogg and I devised a simple plan to sneak aboard the airship. We... Hold our fur hoods down and join the mass of crew as they scurried aboard. Once inside, I found us both a warm, if cramped, hiding place near the boiler rooms. I breathed a sigh of relief as we felt the airship lose its tethers and take to the skies, traveling once more. Sure, let's uh, converse with our master. Ah, uh, Winnipeg, you know anything about. Ah, oh, they say Winnipeg is home to the oldest woman in the world! There's no one who can verify her claim. What about Ottawa? Uh, for instance, some buyers will pay well for oil skins. So, Westers from Ottawa, whatever that is. New York. Did you know the quickest way to New York from here is through Ottawa? Ah, very good. We are woken by a series of loud raps against the door of our hiding place. Please come out, a voice called. We know you're there. <laughs> I remained silent, casting a warning glance at my master. I heard a loud sigh from outside, and the voice continued, Don't worry, you're safe with us. Monsieur Fogg took matters into his own hands and opened the door. A middle-aged Nanette, Nanette's woman stood at the head of a small troop of guards. I am Captain Anne Venuto. The woman grinned, her dark eyes glinting. And you two are aboard my beautiful ship. <laughs> she is a wondrous vessel indeed, I agreed, reasoning that all captains like to hear their airships praised even by stowaways. Isn't she, Captain Venuto? Sighed, she is the most aerodynamic ship we've ever built. The lines of her hull are quite remarkable, I agreed with a sickly smile. The captain stroked a bulk head besottedly. Oh, you're really too kind, she murmured. I summoned all of my courage. Will you return us to Quisituck? The captain cleared her throat. We are heading to Winnipeg in Canada. I see no need to alter our course. Do you? Indeed not, Captain, I replied heartily, a grin spreading under my fine mustache. Well then, the captain continued brusquely, let's get you a proper cabin and a good meal. It's roast seal tonight and cooks an absolute marvel with seal. As we settled down for the night, I was struck by an unrelated thought. Monsieur Fogg, the date line. I have altered our watch already, Monsieur Fogg replied calmly. Did you think I might forget? My master was, of course, correct. With an eye such as his, it was unthinkable that he might miss such a detail. <laughs> we had reached the point directly opposite Greenwich, where the hours we had lost in traveling around the Earth were added back a whole extra day. I don't know what that means, but you know what? Day 38. Got plenty of time, right? Let's groom him. Like a monkey. Like a cat. 
captain brought out a bottle of acrid spirits our second night aboard and handed it around. Sure, let's trust. I took a ship. I took a, I took a sip. Felt my throat catch fire. It felt as though my head had been shattered and hastily recon reconstituted. My tongue was entirely blessedly numb. Strong stuff I managed to cough out to a scattered applause and hoots. So, I asked the captain, after the atmosphere was loosened a little by drink and camaraderie. Uh, why are you helping us escape? Is that what we are doing? The captain raised her eyebrows. I believe that the council should move openly, but they are too cautious, too afraid. They will try and keep our city a secret for ever. Is that a bad thing, I asked. Surely there is risk in being revealed. What is the point of our all our unity and innovation if we all we do is hide? She shot back. Are we truly a nation if our heart is hidden in the ice? A bro brawl broke out between two of the air crew. The captain excused herself to go thump the perpetrators' heads together. Well, I'm glad we didn't get uh, poisoned or whatever. Room him like a dog. The outline of the coast of Hudson Bay loomed gray and barren through the observation window. We are here already, I exclaimed. One of the navigators preened. Our ships are the fastest in the air, he boasted, cracking his knuckles. Not that the rest of the world knows anything of it. We tethered smoothly and disembarked onto sweet, blessed land. Good luck, par Passepartout, Captain Venuto called, in parting. You have done the Arctic peoples a great service at this day by revealing them. Uh, yeah, we gotta, you know, it's stop. Uh, it's Friday. I don't know if I wanna cold climate, valuable in Atlanta. I don't know if we're going to Atlanta. How much is it? 29 pounds, okay. How much are you? 47, might as well, we'll just buy it all. Okay, well, nothing to do but sleep. It all began when my master and I turned a street corner in Winnipeg and found ourselves directly in the path of a galloping horse with no rider to control it. I prepared to grab the reins as it passed. No doubt the horse had merely been frightened and would respond to a calming touch. As the stallion drew closer, I could see its eyes rolling wildly, lips pulled back to display yellowing teeth and foam dripping from its brittle. Okay, this seems like a bad idea, but we're gonna do it. I flexed my hands and snatched for the reins, pulling them sharply as the leather cut into my hands. The horse barely even registered the motion. Indeed, it began to drag me down the street. Oh, man. I swung myself onto the horse's back in a way worthy of a Parisian acrobat. The stallion seemed to shudder all over. It had no doubt dispatched its previous rider in some gruesome fashion. It was looking to be... Looking to similarly or be similarly rid of me I dug my heels into its sides trying to get the creature to stop or at least slow I swear it sped up in response I turned a little in the saddle and saw the silhouette of my master growing smaller and smaller in the distance I had it appeared been kidnapped by a horse Monsieur Fogg would not be pleased But I was enjoying myself nonetheless, the crisp air, the open country, the rolling gait of the horse beneath me. The horse wore itself out <laughs> an hour or so later and consented to let me slide off its back. I was stretching out my stiff muscles in a copse. Tops of trees when the ground began to tremble. A cloud of dust appeared on the horizon, slowly resolving itself into the, a posse of red-coated mounted police. Verde! I plastered a charming smile upon my face, trying not to wince at the twinges in my thighs. The fellow 
in the lead drew up his own mount sharply and fixed me with the hard blue eyes. Stop right there, horse thief. I tried to protest my... Oh, great. We got arrested. We're trying to help. I tried to protest my innocence, but alas, thanks to my horse wrangling, I looked re rather more the vagabond than the impeccable valet. And a trice, I found myself captured, bound, and hauled off to spend the night in jail. I was released the next day. Thanks to Monsieur Fogg's explanation of the circumstances. Ah, uh, yes. As... As it would happen. The Mounted Police did not take very kindly to the suggestion that they incarcerate the demon horse for abduction, and the blue-eyed fellow in charge encouraged us both to leave Winnipeg at our earliest convenience, but to give the man his due, he did arrange with the local train companies to make that as easy as possible for us to do. Well, we gotta figure out routes. You know, we have some time. Let's let's explore America, you know? I took a few hours to explore investigating the various options for how we might continue our journey. You know, if we waited one more day, we could stop off at the bank. Uh we could just go straight on to Chicago. Sure, let's do it. And, uh, well, yeah, it's not gonna be too bad. Well, the train from Winnipeg to Chicago was a dented, ponderous thing made of blackened iron. It looked monstrous, but then we were in monstrously inhospitable territory. Perhaps it was merely shaped to purpose? I could only hope it would suit our own. Sure, let's groom him after that experience with the horse. I encountered a Czech construction worker from Chicago with whom I fell into conversation to find he was working on building the world's very first skyscraper in Chicago, ten stories high with a frame of structural steel and completely fireproof, he boasted. Uh, sounds more trained than a building, I remarked, indicating the compartment all around us. He laughed. Why should our trains be more modern than our houses and office buildings, eh? He rubbed his jaw. It's a good time to be in construction, I can tell you that much. I smiled at his enthusiasm. Pleased to have met a man who had made history with his own two hands. Oh, apparently you meet people who are like... On your travel, you can meet people who were famous in history for whatever reason. Like, I met some popular, like, famous boxer and actually boxed with him and got my ass kicked. That was fun. There was some standing about to be done as the line changed from its northern reaches to its southern jaunt. This occurred in the town of Duluth, far western point of an enormous lake. Oh, Sid. Sorry, my cat. My cat Sid's got a respiratory infection. And it's very, very sad. Which, hang on, which I gazed out across as we waited for the couplings to be sorted out. Surely a boat across such an expanse would take us half the, half the way to London. But I did not suggest a, route, a change of route. The train was comfortable enough warm and the passengers entertaining. We reboarded swiftly and continued our journey in relative comfort. Uh, I don't know. We're talking to Monsieur Bosilav. Chicago, my uncle designed parts of the Western Atlantic Railroad from Chicago to Atlanta. Uh, you know, I don't know. Burlington? Sounds unlikely. Uh, Omaha? Look here, you can obtain cotton flowers in Omaha. You can sell for a profit in Havana. So very glad these random people. Oh, yes, we can go to Chicago and to Atlanta. We can sell that amethyst. No, I didn't have time. At luncheon, a 
lousy blonde haired doctor took several of the passengers to task for failing to wash their hands before taking their meal. Matters of hygiene are absolutely vital, she admonished. I meekly washed my own hands before settling to eat, not wanting to raise her ire. She cast me a quick approving look and introduced herself as Dr. Lydia Berglund from the Chicago Board of Public Health. Any naysayers quickly fell into line at the pronouncement, and the normal proceedings of luncheon gradually recommenced. Dr. Berglund proved, rather surprisingly, an amiable enough conversationalist. To tell you the truth, par past part two, she confided, what I really do for the Board of Public Health is design parks. I guess there's more. What have parks to do with health? Parks are the lung of the city. Oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. Dr. Berglund's eyes shone with intensity of a zealot. That is what my mentor, the great Dr. Roche, Rausch, says. We are building parks all across the city with toilets and sanitation, closing down cemeteries full of festering corpses and making them places of health and greenery and community. Very admirable indeed, I remarked, which rather encouraged her to tell me about the latest park to be renovated in somewhat microscopic detail, still. An afternoon spent with a passionate woman is never a cause for regret. Oh boy, you know what, might as well stop off at the bank. We must visit the bank, Monsieur declared. <laughs> you have additional funds. We're not gonna. I'm not even gonna attempt that robbery business. I am a gentleman. They would extend me credit, if, credit if required. He replied. But do you suppose I put my entire fortune into a carpet bag under your supervision? Of course. I regarded. The bank as we entered. It was a palace of stone and shimmering marble floors with beautiful windows, fountains, and plants. You wish to withdraw funds, we were told. I warn you, it may take some time. A uh, thousand pounds. Tomorrow, I said. The manager nodded. I will have to communicate with London first, of course. She apologized. I should have a reply tomorrow. It seems, Monsieur Fogg remarked as we left, we have some time to dispose of. Let's go to the market. <laughs> of interest to soldier and stubborn types. Elastic wallet. <laughs> False. Oh, uh, let's get that. No. A forged Englishman's passport in the name of Jack Passenger. I don't know why we would need that. Tablet of mint cake, elastic wallet, urban travel. Okay, yeah, let's let's just have that. I guess if we wanted to go to the east or west coast, but no. Ah, oh, we can't do it. Okay, we're gonna have to hotel. Oh, we might make it in time. Walking the streets of Chicago, it quickly became apparent that this was a city in a state of some flux in every way imaginable. From from the sheer quantity of train lines coming into the city from all directions to the arrangements of the city blocks themselves. The blocks I discovered were in motion. The walking busy streets I was forced to stop more than once to make way for a family home set on rollers. Wow, okay. Uh, moving like a gigantic snail while its occupants calmly ate their dinner at the window as they went. A sign propped on the veranda read, J.S. McIntyre, Esquire House Movers. Let's see. A man on the sidewalk beside me cursed under his breath. They act like they own the road, he muttered. Are you suggesting this is a common occurrence? I demanded, staring away at 
as the building took a left turn across busy traffic. It's the seventh one of these I've dodged today, the man grumbled. They're supposed to go to Van Buren and thereabouts, but instead they cruise around on those hickory springs like so many lords and ladies. Uh, but why, I demanded. It was because the mayor wanted the city to be made of stone, so they fitted rollers under the wooden houses to move them out of the way. But you can't just move city folk around like cattle. They got the taste for it, see? People enjoy sunrise on the lake shore, then they go browsing the shops, then go out of the city for the night, all from their living rooms. I thanked the man and made my way carefully across the road, not wanting to be set upon by any roaming low-budget hotels. I returned to Monsieur Fogg at our hotel some time later, but only to find that the city was not tired of toying with me yet. Great. We're going to be late. The establishment, which had been normally positioned when I left it, now required a ladder to enter, having been raised several feet into the air by a team of men with hefty jack screws. Um, I gopped as the owner of the building stuck his head out of a window to shake his fist at the work crew. One of them saw my attention and poked me hard in the chest. You've just run into Chicago's most notorious work gang, he declared. We run this town. I, I don't know a Chicago accent. Sids, oh, you just want to sneeze on me. Um... Are you going to move this building, I asked. Nope, the man replied. We're going to jack it up another six inches for every ten minutes. This miser here doesn't pay his rent. The last words were directed upwards to the win open window, and then he turned back to me. And if you want to go inside, five dollars. Uh, I gave the man three pounds without much thought, leaving him a little puzzled as to how best to have the money changed since the bank had recently disappeared down Main Street in the direction of the lake. Oh no, 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 we gotta, we gotta, or do we? You know what, we don't need to, let's depart. Not gonna wait on the bank. We have enough money, right? And we'll get some more money in Atlanta. My master paced the floor of the Chicago Station Ticket Hall, an estate I can only describe as barely concealed fury as we attempted to work out what train we were supposed to be getting onto. They have, he remarked to me with somewhat less than his usual cool, made something of a conundrum of their train system. What is the problem, Monsieur? I asked, somewhat amused by his annoyance. The station has a rather remarkable number of platforms, he replied, and very little instruction for the casual traveler as to which their train might be departing from. While he cogitated, I stopped a passing porter and inquired if he could aid us. Of course I can, sir, the man replied cheerfully. Platform 12 for Atlanta, but you'd better hurry. I thanked him and then dragged my master away from the timetable board where we caught the train with mere seconds to spare. Well, for once, I selected a good option. Atlanta! Uh, now they say that Atlanta is linked to New York aboard the Piedmont Airline. Ooh. What about... What about New Orleans? Maybe, but you can obtain the wax cylinders inscribed. Yes, I already knew that. Marrakesh. Time. Yeah, you don't want to talk about Marrakesh, do you? It's tempting. I tell you now, it's tempting to go to New Orleans and then go back up. We headed away from Chicago and into the wild wilderness of America, endless meadows stretched away in all directions, broken only by dense patches of forest. Once I saw a lumbering shadow, almost certainly a bear, and I gripped my seat with white knuckles until we were several miles further along. Excuse me? I have, as I may have mentioned, a particular fear of bears. That is news to me. Around the middle of the day, we passed a well well-tilled area set with triangular cloth houses. I looked with some interest. 
Seeing a few people moving about their village, a child waved at the train as it passed, but their mother quickly snatched their hand down. Then in a flash, they were gone, erased by the movement of the train. Uh, of course my nose is stuffy now. No! It's not quick enough. The second day on the tracks we were, was most unremarkable. I passed the time. <laughs> Playing competitive charades with a nervous Irish clerk who turned out to be a cheerful humorist. I won a small sum. Yeah, that's. I, I guess that's kind of cheating. 120 pounds along with my opponent's timetable book for American trains. Finally, we arrived into Atlanta. Ooh, San Francisco, if we really wanted to. Oh, we could even go to Las Vegas. And to Miami. I'll be honest, I kind of want to see New Orleans. Don't need you, don't need you, can sell you, and you. Apparently I had two things of amethyst. Um, arrange things, urban traveler. Sure, let's buy that. <laughs> Gideon's Bible. Ah, uh, well, we're gonna go to New York. So, cotton flower it is. Alright. Oh, I guess we'll explore. We have time. It's day 45. I guess we want to take the train to Miami. Atlanta, at the heart of Georgia, is a busy city with construction on every corner. The Civil War had plainly left its mark. Ah, uh, excuse me. The Civil War had plainly left its mark with bullet hole bricks commonplace. It had been from here that Gen her Major General William Tecumesh, Tecumseh, whatever, that Tecumseh, Sherman, oh, General Sherman, had begun his march through enemy territory to the port of Savannah, burning and wrecking whatever stood in his way. But still, I marveled at how the place was healing, less than a decade later, and already people were focused on building rather than counting the cost. We may not be much to look at today, mister, declared Stanley Goodman, owner of Goodman's and Goodman's, a curious hardware store, bakery, and bookshop into which I stopped to buy something for lunch. But in a few years' time, we'll be state capital, and after that, who knows? Uh. Hang on. We are going around the world, I told him cheerfully. By train, he demanded. I know Europeans are in love with their airships, but they won't last the ways rails will. You'll see. You'll run out of hot air or whatever it is used to keep the things afloat. I attempted to explain the action of hydrogen and air for a few minutes, but Monsieur Goodman grew increasingly uncomfortable and eventually slipped away to attend other customers. I bought a hammer and a sandwich and returned to my master. Okay. Why do I have a hammer? I guess I'm going to go to Washington eventually, so... Never mind, we can't go. No going to... New Orleans, not even an option. As night fell, I spent a few hours walking around and took full advantage of some distance from my master. When I returned, both my spirits and I fancy his were much improved. All right, well, uneventful. To Washington. We boarded a fast new train called the Piedmont Airline 
for the trip to Washington, I thought it was going to be actual airline. The countryside rolled past like an, Engl like an England built on a massive scale. Where trees grew, they formed forests, and where fields stretched, they seemed to carpet the whole world. America was clearly big. One could perhaps spend 80 days simply traveling its length and breadth and admiring the view. Uh, Monsieur Lagarde. Tickets, please. Uh, Washington. Apparently, one can travel aboard the Paul Revere from Washington to Ponta Delgada. About New York. Uh, you mentioned trains. I've been told Atlanta is connected to Miami by rail. Uh, never mind. The quickest way to Dakar from here is to go by Caracas. Now, anyway, do you play football? Yes, sure. Football. The, the European football. Um... Ponta Delgada. Have you heard that Ponta Delgada is linked to London aboard the Six of One? But the fare is over 7,000 pounds. Whoa. What about, uh... Lisbon? I believe so. There is a regular service by air from Ponta Delgada to Lisbon, but the fare is very high. Marrakesh? No idea, but now Jima El Fina is one of the busiest market squares in Africa. Well, we're gonna go to New York. Or are we? No, we're going to Ponta Delgada. <laughs> the train was as fast as advertised when we arrived into Washington in short order and without incident. No, it's Friday. Geez, that's expensive. All right, well, tomorrow at 5 p.m. And time to sleep. People were somewhat wary of Monsieur Fogg as we roamed the streets of Washington. Several buildings had not yet been rebuilt since the burning of the city by the English forces in 1812. Really? Apparently, it's actually Canada who burnt down the White House in 1812. Of course, that was a joke. It was the English. Um, it seemed an overprotective reaction. Not only was that particular skirmish 60 years past, Monsieur Fogg was clearly not a military type. Still, not everyone was cold. A few people were out to make a quick buck. As seems to be the typical as seems to be typical for the treatment of tourists worldwide. Do you want the full tour, gentlemen? asked Hank Hinbury, a man with smooth dark skin and a fine leather jacket who strolled up to us. As though the sight of an English gentleman is battered valet were par for his normal fare. Uh, we are not staying. You're leaving, he smiled. You haven't seen what this place has to offer. And what does this place have to offer? Everything, he replied, spreading his hands wide. Hank leant in closer. Tell me now, he purred. What's your poison? <laughs> oh, we are quite unaccustomed to being poisoned. <laughs> We are quite unaccustomed to being poisoned, I replied archly, and he laughed at that. Well, now, if you're unaccustomed to it, then you should follow me, he slapped me on the back. Here we make bourbon, and it's the best drink known to mankind. I looked to my master, who seemed indifferent. We followed him. He led us down a side alley and through a low, unmarked doorway. Uh-oh. Are we going to miss the train, or the ship or airship or whatever my master looked skeptical but i can only say i had a good feeling about our monsieur hank hinbury that led me to trust him a feeling that was soon to be validated hank stepped inside then turned 
If you wouldn't mind removing your hats, gentlemen, he said. That, that should have war warned me. That should have warned me what was coming, but it did not. It was all too curious. I made a quick excuse and we were hurried out of that alley, insisting we have a steamer to catch. Ack, you fellows are no hope, Hank replied, then took his leave abruptly. A narrow shave, I suspect, Monsieur Falca Fog confided as we stepped away. How unlike him to have an opinion. I think perhaps Monsieur Fogg dislikes, dislikes Americans as much as they dislike him. Okay, well. Let us set off. Oh. Yeah, sure. Ah, uh, listen, my children, and you sure will hear how we boarded the Paul Revere for the ride. Forgive me, my... <laughs> forgive me, friends. The tiny farming island of Ponta Delgada in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I asked a fellow passenger about the trip. Oh, it's simple enough. Madame Constance Climiti. <laughs> Climiti. Climiti. Okay, we're just going to call it Climiti. <laughs> Replied. Just a short hop. I do it regularly. Only the way to get, a, get any writing done. And she waved a small notepad. Fair answer. Sure, let's bug her. Um, Lisbon. Oh, really, Monsieur? I understand there's regular air service. Uh, she had no idea. London. I believe so. Lisbon is linked to London aboard the Madre de Dios, but the fare is extortionate. Um, Porto Novo. I don't know where that is. Oh my, is that the time? That's a little, a little much. I probably have to stay and visit a bank. It occurs to me, my master remarked, as idly as one could imagine, that we are aboard a long-distance airship which, which is not bound for London. But close to London, Monsieur. We could be closer, he replied, returning his attention to his cravat. I found my way to the bridge to discuss the matter with a member of the crew. You want us to go faster, the navigator said. Is that it? I if you can. The navigator turned to consult a fellow crew member. David discussed the matter for a few minutes, then turned back. Can't be done, he declared. We're too far along already. Couldn't do more than a few hours. Ah, uh, very well. There was no changing the physics of the situation, so I retired to the observation deck contemplated the sea far below. Uh, better, better groom him. Monsieur Fogg was, I think, somewhat disappointed when the airship continued to cruise eastwards and finally lowered from the clouds onto the tiny island of Ponta Delgada. I was rather happier to be on dry land and in one piece. Oh, oh, because I couldn't convince them to go someplace else. He doesn't like us. Uh, well, you know what? We didn't... I didn't sell it. Not in the cold climates anymore. Ah, uh, we'll hold on to that, just in case. Air Traveler. We don't need that. We can pick that there. Do we need the hammer? It said, do we need the hammer? Khaki shorts, machete. Uh, we're not really going to a desert. Let's buy it anyway. Sure. We'll complete the set. Uh, let's plan the route. Oh, we could go for 7,000 or Lisbon. Gyrocopter dep departs for Lisbon in two days. Oh, most generous. We shall leave tomorrow. Excellent. Uh, 
Uh, Ponta Delgada was the largest settlement on the volcanic island of Sao Miguel in the Azores. Delicate pewter automata, automata harvested fruit from the abundant er, orangeries, watched over by Portuguese gentlemen farmers in pristine white villas. Monsieur Fogg, of course, took in the pleasant environs with one cursory glance and bent his head to his almanac. You've come so far, I marveled. I can scarcely believe it. My master looked up from his note, taking briefly, We are not in London yet, but we are making excellent time, he said primly. Find out when the next airship to Lis Lisbon departs. A practical suggestion. Time and time again I had seen the prudence of Monsieur Fogg's approach. I paused to breathe in the scent of citrus on the way to the harbor. It lingered in my nostrils for days, long after we had departed the Azores. Well, time to go. That's an interesting device there. Very quaint. We were given a guy or uh, given a gyrocopter ride to Lisbon by one of the local gentleman farmers. Monsieur Coutinou grew oranges and corn, but my real passion, senors, is poetry. Let's groom the master. Grooming the master. Room the master. Did you know, remarked Monsieur Le Pilot, that Antero del Quintel was born in Ponta Delgada, only two streets from my own birthplace? I do not know del Quintel, I admitted. He mostly writes sonnets. I am a great admirer, but I must admit I prefer the modern knight of Baudelaire and Ribaud to the current taste for romanticism. And you? I thought for a moment. Verlaine, for he knows the pull of the unfamiliar. I closed my eyes. Oh, my French is going to be horrible. Javude Acapel Sidoru et de Ils, dont les cieux tilderant son over à vos jeux. Monsieur Cotonou translated. I have seen sidereal archipelagos and islands whose delirious skies are open to the sea wanderer. Yes, I can see why it appeals. The gyrocopter began to to bank. Oh, I see it. Eased on me again. As I saw the coastline on the horizon, Lisbon rose up along a gentle hill, a city of gas-lit whitewashed buildings church spires and snaking tramways set on the Iberian Peninsula. Oh my god, Sid, you've lost so much. Didn't quite get to sneeze on me as much as you wanted. Uh, let's, let's go to the market. Sure, we don't need this. Move this over here. Here. Ooh. We need that. Olive oil. Sells well for high prices in some markets. A pair of galoshes. Yeah, we got it. We got to buy it anyway, so we might as well just. I don't think we're going to go that far. Although, I do want to do a play through through there eventually yeah definitely not gonna go this far that's too far south I wonder what if you can go through South America just hit all that southern hemisphere parts. Okay, well, we can sell that. I don't think there's any point to the olive oil. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a little too much. I can't. Can't, can't. Can't do it. Unless we... Oh, uh, we can do it. But do we want to do it? 
You know what? Let's see if we can do Tangier. Pass the night here. In Lisbon, we sat down to dine at a charming little restaurant with views across the Iberian coastline. The maître de hotel came over came over to our table as the waiter brought our our aperitifs. Senors, he cried, wringing his hands, I have a great favor to ask. Well, ask it already, man, I replied, my stomach rumbling ominously. My foolish brother, what a trial he is to our dear mother, has made a grave error, and we are have get two guests without a table. The matra D looked anguished. Could we possibly impose upon you, senors, and add to your, two to your number? Of course you may, I declared without glancing at my master. He offered no comment, obviously trusting to my instincts on the matter. The matra D ushered a top-hatted English gentleman with his dapper Prussian valet to our table. I've encountered these two before. We were strange mirrors of each other, though Monsieur Fogg and I clearly comprised the superior, more handsome image. Our masters greeted each other and made the particular sort of upper-class small talk which forms a gentle background murmur to a servant's ears. Meanwhile, the Prussian valet introduced himself as Dieterich and gave a hearty sniff as our appetizers were served. I hope the food is up to Herr Montgomery's standards, he remarked. Herr Montgomery is very particular. So is Monsieur Fogg, I insisted. He is most exacting master. Oh, he cannot be as exacting and precise as my own master, Diederich. Insisted and with horrible glee. Why, he is a fiend for detail. We gave each other a look, the sort of look two generals might exchange across a corpse-strewn battlefield. I decided to make an innocuous inquiry and asked what the monsieurs were doing in Lisbon. Ah, uh, well, the thing is, my master and I, Diederich, paused to chuckle to himself. We are traveling around the world. Around the world, I repeated aghast. You mean to say you are? Yes, Diederich nodded with satisfaction and leaned closer for a wager. I stared at him in silent shock. Indeed, Diederich continued implacably. We are heading to Dangia tomorrow and from there to South America and across the Pacific. West instead of east, I mumbled as though in a dream. Diederich ignored me loftily. And what, he asked with awful courtesy, are you and your master doing in London? Uh, we are also traveling around the world, I told him curlishly, and could not resist adding, my master and I went the sensible way, and we are nearly back to London. Monsieur Montgomery looked up from his plate, his eyes cool and remote. What a remarkable coincidence, he remarked without expression. Quite, my master responded. Let us give you some advice, I added, since we have just come that way. Dietherick raised one overly sharp eyebrow and did not decline my offer. Yes? Don't buy too much expecting to sell elsewhere. Markets broad never pay well. Dieterich smiled thinly. This very meal is being paid for by the sale of a single monocle. One simply has to make good trades. I saw my master's reaction to that. We all took our leave with awful echoing politeness and I made sure to... Press Dieterich's hand with particular firmness as we parted. I think we understood each other, valet to valet. You seem discomfited. Asked Pertu, my master remarked with the barest hint of a smile. I did not like that Monsieur Montgomery, I told him. He did not seem quite cold and distant to you. Or, did he not seem quite cold and distant to you? Ugh. Such a sphinx-like gaze he had as though he would think twice before spitting on you if you were on fire. Pass Pertu, Monsieur Fogg said with a small sigh in his voice. You are a man of remarkable depths. And he hates us. Let's just... I don't know. We're not. We're not. We're not. We're gonna explore and see if we can go to Tangier and just completely ru ruin our chances of getting there within 80 days. I spent a few hours in exploration learning ways in which we might travel onwards. 
Nope, there, there's no other way to go. <laughs> sure, why not? Well, this is it. This is it. We left Lisbon aboard the Madre de Dios, an old Torres Quevedo airship with a belly full of agave, oranges, and early season cherries. The smell of ripe fruit, of ripe fleshed fruit, would no doubt tantalize me for the duration of our one day journey to London. Ah, uh, let's groom him. So he's at 100% when we get there. Monsieur Fogg looked out of the observation deck windows with perfect calm, and there was no reason to be concerned. We were safely within our 80 day window. I could not wait to stride into the Reform Club and claim our prize. I spent the remaining time watching every possible danger, one eye on the crew, the other on the ship, ready to react to the slightest trouble, but nothing broke the peacefulness of our day. We tethered at the airship dar dock in Hyde Park, and felt, for the first time in fifty days, the feel of English soil under our shoes. At long last we had returned to London, and in plenty of time to win the wager. Well, that is that. Ouch. I seized my master by the collar and threw him into one of the steam carriages idling on the banks of the Serpentine in Hyde Park. To the Reform Club, I shouted. <laughs> uh, before ejecting the driver from his seat and taking the wheel myself, I threw a lever and opened the throttle. The driver's curses were drowned by the shrieking whistle of the boilers. There is no need for, us, uh, for such unseemly haste, Passport 2, my master noted. But I was a man possessed. The streets of London seemed... Quaint and old-fashioned as they flashed past my well-traveled eyes. The carriages were mostly horse-drawn and gas lamps, rather than electricity lit our way as we raced down Pall Mall. The carriage barely shuddered to a steam-hissing stop before I dragged my master from his seat and up the steps to the imposing doors of the Reform Club. I released him only when we reached the Great Saloon, where... <laughs> I will not select that last one. My master's erstwhile friends stood from their chairs, gaping in an attitude of great shock. Monsieur Fogg only straightened a little and said in his calm voice, Gentlemen, I am here. The room erupted into cheers, and I staggered to the nearest chair and collapsed heavily into it, my hands shaking. I realized as though a spell had suddenly broken that we had succeeded. And, despite a most unconventional route, my master had won 20,000 pounds. With the 4,000 we began with and our remaining funds, it was a profit of over 16,000. Hardly a meager sum. My heart began to beat again, and I saw for the first time the crowds who f had forced their way into the club to witness the momentous occasion. A journalist in a dark blue bonnet caught my eye. And you must be the lo loyal valet, Passepartout, she said. I do not believe we have been introduced, I remarked. All of London has been feverishly following Phileas Fogg's progress in the papers. She swept her gaze over me and scribbled furiously in her notebook. Your master will be tomorrow's headline, or I'll eat my hat. It is a fine hat, I agreed. She laughed. Then I will be glad not to have, have to eat it. I pushed my way to Monsieur Fogg, who had nearly been swallowed by congratulatory crowds. You have won the bet, Monsieur. I took him. And seized my master by the hand and shook it as though we were two equals, not merely a master and a servant. Monsieur Fogg pressed my hand warmly and did not remark even once upon the impropriety of my gesture. Indeed, though his cool gaze did not so much as waver or soften, I believe he welcomed the chance to shake my hand. I could not have done it without you, my dear Passepartout, Monsieur Fogg said simply. 
It was praise as valuable as rubies or gold, and I took it as such. My last playthrough, it 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 was uh, much more friendly, and he said, "We are, you are a great person, and you are a great person, Passport Two. You're our, you're a friend. Not not this, not this reception." Um. Mr. Fogg, Mr. Fogg, the blue bonneted journalist cried, interrupting our conversation. What next for the great adventurer Phileas Fogg and his loyal valet Passepartout? My master looked at me. I laughed like a maniac. Perhaps we should do it again, I declared, but this time going the long way. I looked around at, face at faces of the assembled crowd and quirked an eyebrow. Anyone care to make a wager? Monsieur Fogg refrained from rolling his eyes. I believe, he said with great deliberation, that tonight I will have supper and go to bed. Come, Passepartout, it grows late. Yes, Monsieur Fogg, I said and followed. Your journey round the world was complete. The Times, Monsieur er, <laughs> Fogg returns with time to spare. Journey completed in 50 days despite the sheer size of the world and near fatal polar expedition. Oh boy, well, that was, that was quite the ordeal. Barely made it through the polar, through the Arctic. Apparently places are that most sinister pair. Uh, bright and passionate and unsurpassed. Comfortable. Uh, 13 out of, okay, yeah. I, just 13 cities, my goodness.